everything gets started. So how's that? Uh, good evening, everybody. Tonight we're going to be looking at a man named John Gill. He was a Baptist from a very long time ago. We're going to be looking at John Gill, and we're also going to be looking a little bit at the commentary that he wrote. And so that's what you have, that little uh, sheet in front of you. Um, if you don't, I do have some extra ones. But when it comes to Bible commentaries, I've heard at least three different opinions on whether or not you should use them and how to use them or when to use them. One opinion is that you should never use Bible commentaries. And the idea behind it is, and there's, there's kind of two, two different reasons for this. Some say that you need to study for yourself, that you need to do the hard work of digging into Scripture and finding out what it means. Or others say you don't need a commentary because if you have the Holy Spirit in you, then He will tell you the right interpretation. And so you don't need the words of man, you just need the words of God. So that's one view. Another view is that you can use Bible commentaries, but only as a last resort. In other words, do your best to figure it out yourself. And then if in all your study you still can't quite get it, well then you can turn to a Bible commentary. The third view is held to by a preacher named Steve Lawson, and he says the first thing you should do is go to the Bible commentaries. And his view is, why would I not go to all the wisdom of these great men of the past to get my mind at least going in the right direction on a certain passage? Uh, so he starts with the commentaries. And you know, there's a little bit of truth in all of those statements. You know, it is true that the Holy Spirit helps us understand God's Word. It is true that you should be studying on your own, that you should try to dig and, and, and figure out for yourself. Um, but it's also true that God has given teachers to the church, and that's not just living teachers, that's teachers from the past as well. And also, I do think it's a little bit prideful to think that all those other people needed help, but you don't. Um, I, think, I, think I, can, uh, I think I can use a little help myself sometimes. So I do believe that commentaries should be used. Now, I do like older commentaries in particular. And uh, so the one that we're going to be looking at tonight is written by, as I said, a man named John Gill. So we're going to look at his life, but then also his commentary. So first, who was John Gill? Gill was born in England in 1697. So most of his life was in the 1700s, but a few years were in the 1600s. So he was born in 1697 to a middle-class family. Uh, he had Christian parents, and his father worked in the wool industry, weaving wool into garments. From a very young age, John Gill had a love of learning. He attended a grammar school for a time, and he quickly surpassed even the older students. I mean, he quickly passed everybody. He very quickly mastered Latin. He could read some of the classic works in Latin. He also became very good at Greek. Now, again, this is in grammar school. This is all before he turned 12 years old. So he's learning Latin, learning Greek, and actually fluent enough in those where he could actually read books in those languages. Well, he also hung out at the bookstore quite a bit. In fact, he was at the bookstore so often that the people in his town had a saying. You know how we have all these sayings that if something is certain, we say, as sure as such and such, something's going to happen, you know? Well, the saying in John Gill's town, even when he was a young child, was, as sure as John Gill is in the bookstore. <laughs> that meant it was a sure thing. Well, the language that Gill loved the most was the Hebrew language. And he taught himself how to read Hebrew from a Hebrew grammar book and lexicon. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, he taught himself, as I said, Hebrew at a very young age. And then he quit school. Um, there's a bunch of different circumstances that led into that. But basically his family didn't want him there anymore. So he, he quit school at 12 years old. About that same time... In his church, his preacher preached a sermon, and the sermon was on Genesis 3, verse 9. Now, you remember what happens in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sin, and they don't run back to God. In fact, they run from God, and they try to hide, and then God seeks after them. 
Well, Genesis 3, verse 9 says, The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Well, that started the wheels turning in John Gill's young mind. And he asked himself, Where am I? Where is my life going? What is the state of my soul? Am I headed for heaven or am I headed for hell? And so that sermon made a big impact on him and convicted him of his sins. Now, even though he was saved at around 12 years of age, he didn't make a public profession of faith until seven years later, until he was 19. Now, one of the reasons he waited to make a public profession of faith is he he was a little nervous that as soon as he made a public profession of faith, that his church is going to ask them to be their minister. Well, his fears were not unfounded. (laughs) He was actually right. The Sunday after he made a public profession of faith and was baptized, that evening some of his congregation met in a home for a time of prayer. And During that evening, he was asked to read Isaiah 53, which of course talks a lot about Christ, and then give an explanation of that passage. Well, the next Sunday evening at the same home, he was asked to preach his first sermon. And so he began his preaching career at age 19. So yeah, his, his fears were correct that as soon as he made a profession of faith, they tried to get him to be their pastor. Well, he did serve in that church for a little while, but a couple years later, he moved to London and began to pastor a church there. In fact, he would go on to pastor that church in London for 51 years. So he was a pastor there for a very long time. Now, this church, um, it actually went by many names because this congregation would move (laughs) from town to town uh, over a long period of time, and so it was named by, uh, known by different names, but this church had a very rich history. Um, I can't think of any church, much much less a Baptist church, that has a history like this church. First of all, you have the fact that the great John Gill was a pastor of this church. But prior to that, this church was pastored by a man named Benjamin Keach. And I don't know if you've heard the name Benjamin Keach. I actually saw we do have a booklet out in the foyer by Benjamin Keach. But Keach was really the first well-known Baptist theologian. Now, he wasn't the first, but he was the first well-known Baptist theologian. He helped write the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. You may have heard of that. It's an old Baptist document back in the 1600s. And uh, it used to be the most common confession of faith that Baptist churches used. Well, Benjamin Keach's son, Elias Keach, came to America, and he helped start the First Baptist Association here in America. It was up in Philadelphia. Um, So that that great Baptist family, (laughs) and one of them, Benjamin Keach, was a pastor of this church before John Gill pastored that church. Now, after Gill came a man named John Rippon. John Rippon published a hymn book <clears throat> that had the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. You've probably heard that hymn. That hymn probably would not be popular if it were not published by John Rippon. Now, John Rippon, uh, I talked about how Gill pastored the church for 51 years. John Rippon pastored that same church for 63 years. So in 114 years, that church had two pastors. Two pastors in 114 years. Well, um, a few pastors after John Rippon, that same congregation, although it had moved by now, was pastored by a Mr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So you see all the big names of pastors that pastored that church over the years. Um, That is definitely, definitely a church with a history. Well, anyway, getting back to Gill. Um, Gill wrote many books and many booklets. Um, He once wrote a book defending the Baptist view of baptism. Because, you know, that was a very big controversy in those days. In fact, it still kind of is amongst some churches. But when American Baptists heard that Gill had written that book, they said, hey, can you send some over here so that we can make a defense of our views over here in America? Now, as we looked at uh, Gill, we saw that he, he did love the Hebrew language. In fact, he wrote a book on it 
the 334 page book on the Hebrew language and the reason he did it is just for fun <laughs> just for fun he loved the Hebrew language so much that he just wanted to write a book he didn't plan on publishing it but then after people heard about it and wanted it then he eventually published it but at first he just did it for recreation he just wanted to write a book in his spare time on the Hebrew language <clears throat> well he also wrote about uh, salvation um, because even back in that day there was a controversy over how you can be saved whether or not your salvation uh, whether or not you can lose it, all these things. He even wrote um, a book against a book that John Wesley had written because he disagreed with John Res Wesley on salvation. But um, he wrote about salvation from what's known as an Augustinian view. And basically what that means is that we humans are so bad that we can do nothing to save ourselves. That salvation has to be a 100% work of God, which, by the way, is the, the view that I hold. And um, he wrote about this view, and from this perspective, uh, so much so that a good friend of his that goes by the name of Augustus Toplady, or I've heard it pronounced Tope Lady, who also wrote a pretty famous hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, May I Hide Myself in Thee. Uh, so Tope Lady said, quote, Perhaps no man since the days of Augustine has written so largely in defense of this view of grace. So, uh, quite a compliment there from his good friend, Tope Lady. Augustus Tope Lady also said that whenever John Gill got into a, a debate, and usually this was done by writing books. Someone would write a book, then someone would write a book refuting it, and then that person would write a book refuting the refutation. Uh, <clears throat> Tope Lady said that whenever Gill got into a debate, he always won. He always won. Now he got into a lot of debates, so that's, that's saying something. So how did this man who didn't go to college, didn't go to seminary, how did he write so effectively? What was, what was the secret? Well, I think historians will probably debate me on this, but my personal opinion is that it had something to do with the breakfast he had every morning. Every morning for breakfast he had chocolate. <laughs> Okay, maybe that's not what caused his the theological genius. To me, that's every kid's dream, right? <laughs> Having chocolate for breakfast. Um, you can hang out together because he eats chocolate all day long. Yeah, yeah. So, um, don't know what type of chocolate. All I know is that his biography said that he had chocolate for breakfast every morning. So, well, there's a whole lot more that we could say about John Gill, um, but I do want to look a little bit at his commentary. Um, I want to give you some, some facts about his commentary and then actually read some of his commentary, so we'll get to that in just a minute. John Gill's commentary is usually compared to Matthew Henry's commentary, and the reason for that is because they wrote around the same time. Um, Matthew Henry was a little before John Gill, but their life did overlap a little bit, and they're both from England, so their commentaries are, are usually compared. Um, they both have their advantages and their strengths and their weaknesses. For instance, when it comes to life application, where it talks about, okay, now how do you live out this Bible passage? Matthew Henry is actually a little better at life application than John Gill is. That's not to say that John Gill didn't have life, life application in his commentary. He's just got plenty of it, just not quite as much as Matthew Henry. John Gill, however, does include more history in his commentary. Remember his love of the Hebrew language and of the Jewish people and the study of Jewish history. So oftentimes, as you go through John Gill's commentary, you're going to get some bit of Jewish history, which is very helpful because, well, first of all, the Old Testament was written to the Jews, but even the New Testament was written in the context where a lot of new believers were Jewish. And the writers of the New Testament, like Paul and Peter, were Jewish as well. So sometimes they use Jewish figures of speech. And John Gill is very helpful giving some of the history behind that. His commentary, Gill's commentary, is slightly more technical. Um, he does go into a little bit of the words, the Greek words and the Hebrew words. Um, so it's a little more technical, but not overly so. Um, I've actually read some other commentaries written later that are even more technical than his. 
One of the things about Gill's commentary is it is a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Now, you would think that most Bible commentaries are verse-by-verse, -verse, but actually very few are. Most of them go verse-by-verse -verse when they're going through like a letter of Paul or something like that. But there's some sections of Scripture, it's really hard just to go phrase-by-phrase-by-phrase. Phrase and so even Matthew Henry would sometimes just write a commentary on a big section of Scripture. But John Gill goes verse-by-verse verse and very often phrase by phrase by phrase by phrase so it's a very detailed which that's very helpful because sometimes you don't want to read about all of the passage you just want to read about one phrase and you can go to Gill's commentary and find an explanation of that phrase very quickly one of the biggest advantages at least for me is that it's baptistic <laughs> Um, he was writing just after the Puritan era, so he still has a lot of Puritan theology, which in my mind is a good thing. But a lot of the Puritans were not Baptists, and so sometimes you'll get some different views that I wouldn't agree with. Uh, but John Gill, even though he would not be technically considered a Puritan, um, he had a Puritanical theology with a Baptist twist to it, which to me is, is a very good thing. Well, is it hard to read? I mean, after all, it was written in the 1700s. Well, I have to admit, it's a little hard to read. It can be. But sometimes not as hard as you may think. Um, sometimes you read his commentary and it sounds just like it was written today. One of the criticisms that Gill has had is that sometimes he'll go on and on and on and on about all the wrong interpretations <laughs> until he gets to what he thinks is the correct interpretation. Sometimes that can be a little tedious. Um, but overall, it's not, not the most difficult read. So if you have your paper in front of you, I do want to just briefly look at this commentary on just one verse. Again, this is just one out of, well, obviously tens of thousands of verses in the Bible. The verse is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 where it talks about not forsaking the assembling one to another, right? We always quote that verse talking about how you need to come to church. The Bible says you need to come to church. Well, as you look at this in the first paragraph there, the bold is scripture, and then what comes after that is his commentary. So the scripture says, as the manner of some is, and his commentary says, or custom, and this prevailing custom among these Jews might arise from the contempt of the Gentiles or fear of reproach and persecution. So what he does first is he talks about what this would have meant to the original audience. And that's very important. You know, have you ever been in a Bible study? In fact, I've been guilty of this. And you open up a Bible, you read a verse, and you say, what does this mean to you? Well, there's a sense in which it was written to you, but there's a greater sense in which it was actually written to somebody in, in this case, in the first century. You start by asking, what did this mean to them? So Gill does that, but then he says, he goes on to say, and in our day, and then he talks about this evil practice of missing church, and he gives some reasons why. So he starts with the original audience, but then he talks about how it applies to the modern day or in his day, which again is how I believe a good commentary should work. What does it mean to the original audience now? What does it mean to me? <laughs> how does it apply today? Well, if you look at um, the middle paragraph there, the Bible says to exhort one another, and he gives a commentary on that. And the thing that I wanted to bring out is, look what he says. He says, to prayer, to attend public worship, to regard all the duties of religion. One of the good things about reading an older commentary is that you get to see a different perspective on things. They use words differently than what, with the way we use them, and they use uh, words that we don't often use. For instance, most people say, well, Christianity isn't a religion. Well, obviously, Gil didn't have a problem talking about religion. He uses the word right here. Also, some modern Christians say, you know, we shouldn't talk about duty. We shouldn't talk about being obligated. We should obey God out of love. Well, we should obey God out of love. But that doesn't erase the fact that we have a duty to do what he has told us to do. And so here, Gil uses the word duties. By the way, I heard that he used that word quite often. That was one of his favorite words. Um, so, 
The last paragraph there, I want to look at a couple things that I think every good commentary should have. First of all, I want to look at uh, a good aspect of this commentary, but then, if I haven't convinced you yet, I want to show you why it's so important to read commentaries. So, last sentence there, he says, And so much more, this is the Bible, as ye see the day approaching. Now, he's going to talk about the day. What day? What day were they watching approaching? Well, he gives you three answers. First possible answer, he says, either the day of death, meaning as you see your death approaching, be all the more diligent to go to church. Or, second option, he says, or the last judgment, the day that Christ returns, as you see the day that Christ returns approaching, be careful to go to church. Now, most modern Christians, I think, would go with that second interpretation. They would say that the day being spoken of here is the coming of the Lord. That's actually not Gill's view. Here's the third option. Or rather, of Jerusalem's destruction. So he's saying that the day that was approaching them was the day when Rome would invade Jerusalem and tear down the temple and almost wipe out the Jewish people. So he says that's the day. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of why I believe that's the correct interpretation, but if you had not read that commentary, and you just read Hebrews where it said, as the day approaches, most modern Christians, their mind thinks that day is talking about the coming of the Lord. Gill says, that's an option, maybe that's it, but he says it's probably a reference to Jerusalem's destruction. Now that totally, at least in my mind, changes the meaning of this verse. Remember, Hebrews was written to Hebrews. They were in around Jerusalem. And so Gil's interpretation, the writer of Hebrews was saying, your country is about to be destroyed. You need to be making sure that you're meeting with other believers. You guys need to come together. You know, this, all this stuff that we've suffered in the last year, churches have been meeting less and less and less. And I'm thinking, no, we need to be meeting more and more and more. As we see our nation falling apart, we need to be meeting more and more. Well, now I'm preaching, so I'll stop. <laughs> but again, if you had read that verse without looking at the wisdom of a guy named John Gill. Now, he didn't just make up that interpretation. He has a very thorough reason, uh, the context of the book, the context of that passage. And so I, I, for one, don't mind relying at least a little bit on commentaries. I think they're very helpful. So there you have it, a brief sketch of the man John Gill in his commentary. His commentary was the first commentary in English to go verse by verse. And it was the first commentary from a Baptist perspective. So I think that we have a lot to thank God for, because God accomplished quite a bit through his servant, John Gill. Thank you.